Before the diss tracks by Lamar and Drake, there were the book reviews, the diss book reviews by Serge Lang and Louise Mordell. And if you haven't never heard of this bit of math drama, of math history, please stay and watch this video because they are classics of book reviews. Now, for full disclosure, Lang was my advisor's advisor, so I'm slightly biased. The first of the two reviews appeared in 1964, and it was a review by Louis Mordell of Serge Lang's Diophantine Geometry. And now, I don't know what happened between the two of them before this for Mordell to write this vicious book review. The review starts like any other review, describing what's the topic of the book and also what's in the book, very neutral, very demure. And when he's done describing the contents of the book, he goes for the throat. A general question that immediately suggests itself to a reader is what object an author has in mind when writing a book. Some have the true teacher spirit, or even a missionary spirit, wishing to introduce their subject to a wide circle of readers in the most attractive way. Blah, blah, blah. When the subject makes undue demands on the reader, the author tries to give the reader some idea of the proof in easily understood language. Lang is not such an author. <laughs> Most of the book is practically unreadable unless one is familiar with, among others, Bourbaki, the author's books on algebraic geometry and abelian varieties, and Vey's foundation of algebraic geometry, and is prepared to occasionally to go to, to the original sources for proofs of some theorems needed in the present volume. However, in his pages on prerequisites, he refers to the elementary nature of a number of his chapters and their self-containment. Many readers will not accept either of these statements. It is unfortunately and it, that it will be exceedingly difficult for them to learn something about the most of these topics from the presentation given in this book. Oh, and he keeps going. The author's style and exposition leave a great deal to be desired. The results in the book appear as theorems, propositions, properties, lemmas, and even a criterion. The logical distinction between these is not at all clear. When a reference is made to one of them, the reader must turn over the pages of the relevant chapter to find it, and occasionally it is non-existent, and he gives some references of propositions that just do not exist. And there is more. His presentation of proofs often seems unattractive. He would avoid much unnecessary repetition that also makes the enunciation of many results of inordinate length. He would save a great deal of space which could be used more advantageously otherwise. More! There is often an impression of vagueness about some of his proofs. They seem to lack the clarity one associates with demonstrations. Even when he does give definitions or details, he often gives them in the wrong place and at the wrong time, and when they are not really necessary. <laughs> and then at the end, he tries to soften the blow by saying, so much for the detailed criticism, this may tend to blind us to some merits of the book. But ends with the following. How much greater thanks would he have earned if the book had been written in such a way that more of it could have been more easily comprehended by a larger class of readers? It is to be hoped that someone will undertake the task of writing such a book. And then he went on to write such a book. And here comes Lang. Lang reviews Mordell's Diophantine Equations in 1970. Just like Mordell, his review starts like any other book review with a summary of uh, the topic and what's in the book. And once he's done, like Mordell did, he goes for the throat. As can be seen from this sketch, the contents of the book are jumpy, and some comments are now in order concerning the broader implications of Mordell's style, his point of view, and the context in which he writes. He collects together special cases without particularly unifying order or any design that I could make out that might tie them together or make their succession in 30 chapters more than what appears to be an arbitrary succession. That is Mordell's taste, and I cannot quarrel with it. Lang loved a quarrel. I personally had bought a copy of the book, now given to the library. But the reader must be aware of the limitations of Mordell's exposition. For one thing, Mordell clings systematically to the chronological development of the subject throughout the book, even when an important development has taken place, subsuming previous results in the subject. However, the inexperienced reader will have to figure out for himself that a single formulation of Roth's theorem in number fields can be used effectively for all of these applications, because Mordell is not making it clear. 
Even though I find the succession of equations treated somewhat arbitrary, there seems to be one thread which runs through them, and then he goes on to disparage that thread. Uh, and then he also says, however, Mordell's taste when faced with a theorem like Siegel's on curves of higher genus is just to say, the proof is of a very advanced character, and leave it at that. And then towards the end of the review, Lang brings up Mordell's review of his own books uh, with a couple of remarks. First, he quotes a letter from Mordell to him, uh, telling him that he did struggle with Diophantine geometry and that he found algebra, Lang's algebra, quite readable and very useful. It was very obviously meant to be understood. <laughs> and then Lang quotes a letter that he wrote uh, back in the day to Mordell about the review that Mordell wrote about his book. When you write of any book that it is obviously meant to be understood, whether as a compliment for one book or blame for another, you're still missing the point. I never meant Diophantine geometry to be understood specifically by you or anyone who did not have the rather vast background required for its reading, implying that Mordell, of all people, didn't have the background in Diophantine geometry to read Lang's book. All of my books are meant to be understood by readers having the prerequisites for the level at which the books are written. And then he goes on to defend himself that he wants to write the books he wants to write. And he's asking for others to just accept what's written. And this is known as aesthetic tolerance. But just as a composer of music, I have to take my responsibility as to what I, I consider to be beautiful and write my books accordingly, not just with the intent of placing one segment of the population, uh, let pleasure then fall where it may. Search Lang.